In this episode, we look at how to manage hybrid and remote projects. Hello and welcome back to the Project Management Podcast at pmpodcast.com. This is the live stream for episode number 476. I am Cornelius Fichtner. Thank you very much for joining me today. Yes, it is 476, not 474, like I almost said. Uh, for those of you who are accessing this episode recorded, uh, not live, please remember that this is a video episode. So if you're only getting the audio, then please do look for the play video episode link in your podcast app or visit pm-podcast.com. Com. All right. Um, here is our agenda. We want to talk about managing hybrid and remote projects today with Dave Garrett. And let's bring Dave in here. Uh, here we are. Hello, Dave. Uh, Hi, next to each other. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to be here. 476 episodes. My God, what, a, what an accomplishment. <laughs> That's yeah, I, I I didn't expect it would end up that much, but I, I had an inkling because my first episode, I didn't just call it episode one. I called it episode zero, zero, one. So I had some plans. <laughs> <laughs> so the numbering still works there. Yeah, so our agenda here today, we want to start out by looking, give you a quick preview and talk about what you will can expect and get out of this. We want to talk about five challenges and uh, also power skills are going to be mixed into that all the time a little bit. But also in the end, when it comes to managing hybrid and remote products, who's responsible? And of course, we'll close everything out with a uh, quick takeaways. But before we get started, for those of you who don't know Dave, um, he is the Chief Strategy and Growth Officer for PMI at PMI.org. And Dave crafts and drives the execution of the PMI strategy. And his job is to create clear growth paths. Uh, he works across the organization to define, test, and deliver, as they say on PMI's website, new products that matter to deliver a dramatic increase in value to our customers. He's also charged with assisting PMI to build teams that are aligned and integrated seamlessly across the organization. I want to get back to that maybe just a moment. Dave joined PMI in 2014. That is when PMI purchased project management dot com and uh, he also worked on a book called project pain reliever a just-in-time handbook for anyone managing projects it's available on amazon he's a graduate from the american university in washington dc with a master's of science in management information systems and for my first question to you dave i want to go back to that one sentence in your bio where it says and uh I, I quote here again he is charged with assisting pmi to build teams that are aligned and integrated seamlessly across the organization is that the reason how this got started because you're working with those teams that you were starting to think about you know remote teams and remote work uh, that was part of it, absolutely. And we've gone through quite a transformation at PMI, and there's been a lot of uh, integration, a lot of changes in the way that we work internally. And as the world's changed, PMI has changed as well. So we have a lot of uh, internal talk, internal um, evolving of the ways that we work uh, all the time. So that's part of it. And another part is uh, I also run thought leadership as part of my, um, that's part of my, under my umbrella of strategy and growth. Um, and we do a lot of, uh, we talk a lot to our various uh, stakeholders about these topics, uh, whether it's through the Global Executive Council or directly to uh, our members. So we gather a lot of information. We try to disseminate some of that back to uh, to our stakeholders as well, just in a, trying to be helpful during this time of uh, the never normal, if you will. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, before we get going and, and look at what people can expect. If anybody has a question, if you're joining us live here, please don't forget we have a chat. Please put your question or your comment into the chat and I'll bring it up. If you have a, a, your own challenges for managing remote work, hybrid projects, or if you have a good solution, 
please feel free to type that in as well. So to get us started, uh, Dave, what can people expect to take away today from our conversation? What will they walk away with? You know, it's interesting, Cornelius. There's so many point solutions out there when you look across, uh, you know, the new ways of working, remote work, hybrid work. How do I do this? Many of the how to's are um, they feel very one size fits all, you know, and, and when we're all sort of sitting in a situation where um, that's really not the case, we're all a little bit different. We're all in the same boat in one sense, but in another sense, every situation is unique in the same way that uh, we've always told people you manage each person individually, you know, depending on their context, the type of person they are, how they need to be managed. You need to manage remote work in the same way. Um, so what I'd like to do is offer two basic concepts, I think, that can be applied across uh, all of the questions that you're asking yourself. We think a lot about um, two things when we think about remote work. We think about visibility and we think about connectedness, those two things. So visibility of the work, visibility of the people in, the, in an appropriate way, and then connectedness. How, how connected are you to the work and how connected are you to the people? And I think if you can ask those two questions in a little bit greater, uh, I'll, I'll go down a little bit, You know, show a few more layers of depth there. But if you think about those things deeply in terms of everything you do with regard to remote or hybrid work, um, it's, it's a very helpful construct because it, it allows you to find your own solution in the right way that is meaningful for you. So um, I'll say a couple things about uh, visibility and connectedness. I think visibility has always been sort of a central tenet of agility, you know, making work visible. You think about Kanban boards, you think about all the reporting that goes away when you share a perspective on the work, you know, the reporting. Uh, doesn't have to happen, doesn't have to be generating a bunch of additional documents for management. Management understands what you're doing by looking at the same board that you're looking at. And, and you can use that as a communication tool, a reference point to eliminate a lot of meetings. And that's super important in this Zoom world that we live in today, you know, trying to trying to eliminate as many meetings as we can, the, the things that are wasteful. And then Visibility of people is very, very important. You know, we don't we don't want to wear people out, but um, in this new environment, there's an advantage to the fact that I can reach out and call you over over whatever medium messaging platform, where I can you know text you or I can email you. There's various forms of communication, and appropriately used, it makes everyone accessible, not just visible, but accessible um, at the right time. That's something to be managed, but. Um, you know, it's 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 something to be utilized as well. You know, the trick there is to really clarify when each person is available for what medium so they can do their best work. Um, so that's that's a little bit about visibility. Um, connection is actually even more important to me. And uh, it's something that we've been talking a lot about internally. We've been working with a uh, Harvard professor by the name of James Kane, and he studies connectedness very, very deeply. Um, he talks about three things that make you feel more connected to people or work, right? Uh, one of them is, does this make me feel safe? These questions you sort of should ask yourself around connectedness that indicate whether you are or not. Does this make me feel safe is one. Does this make my life better is two. And does this make my life easier is three. And if you think about all your connections to people and, you know, and, and think about those three things, safer, better, easier, you think about how connected you feel to that person, it's often based on those three things. And you think about the work that you do and how connected you are to that work, how meaningful it is to you, those three things really matter. Does this make me, do I feel safer? Do I, do I feel like my life is better? Do I feel like my life is easier now? Those things are really, really important. I think they're even more important in a remote environment because uh, we're all searching a little bit for that psychological safety that we're all discussing in various forms, right? Um, we're looking for ways to make our lives a little bit easier because it's hard now, you know, in, in a lot of ways and, uh, you know, and, and just better, you know, everybody who isn't looking for better, you know, so um, those are really important just as framing questions that the idea of visibility and connectedness and looking at them in those ways, I think is really helpful to defining your own solutions. You know, when we originally talked about doing this interview, uh, we said we we're going to talk about remote work and hybrid projects and all of that. Um, and I did not expect that to be your response to my first question, to tell you the truth. Visibility, connectedness is probably something that we don't think about enough. Um, 
everybody says, you know, this is the new world, this is the new now, and, you know, everybody works from home. Well, tell you the truth, my company has been like that since we founded it in 2007. Everybody works from home. So to us, this is, this is the old new, this is the old normal. But I don't think that even in our company, we thought about connectedness, we thought about visibility. How do we make this happen? Before this, you know, it was kind of occasionally we brought people in. We had a, a gathering of, of the group in a single city. But during the pandemic, that went out the window. Hopefully we can pick this up again. PMI is pretty much the same. You have a global team that needs to be visible to each other, that needs to be connected to each other. Is, is this how the five challenges, and, and let me bring, bring up my next slide here because we're, we're now slowly moving into, into the, the five challenges here, and I'll, I'll show them uh, in just a moment. Is this how these five challenges got identified? Is it based on PMIs, learnings, PMIs way of doing doing work? Um, well, a lot of the way this the the, way, the five challenges emerged from uh, stakeholder feedback. You know, whether we're talking about large surveys, large scale surveys, or um, more uh, interview type situations with uh, global executive council members about their businesses and how their businesses are being run. So let's just say it bubbled up across the board from a lot of you know feedback from actually thousands of people. So that's that's how uh, we arrived at these particular yeah. challenges. And in the end, you know, there are so many more challenges that you could think of. Uh, for example, you know, the technology becomes important. Mm -hmm. um, technology is not part of the five challenges. How did they get selected out of these all of these interviews? You must have had a list, you know, a mile long. You know, I think some of these things are technology, for instance, is embedded across the board in all of the challenges. You know, what what is the technology angle in all of these things? Um, you know, you think about collaborating with teams and organizational leaders. How is that done these days? You know, and that, and that's the technology plays a big role in that understanding how to use that technology effectively and understanding what the sort of emotional wrapper is around this around those technologies. You know, it, it's uh, um, I think a Sticking a little bit in the context of one of the one of the particular challenges around um, how uh, problem solving is is, a, is an important skill these days, right? But the wrapper around that is collaborative leadership. The, the emotional wrapper, the power skills wrapper around that is 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 is, uh, is collaborative leadership. Um, and the reason being is that you can solve problems on your own. There are techniques you could use on your own or in groups. But if you use them effectively within groups, collaboratively, like within a group, you uh, you end up defining which problem to solve together. And then you solve that problem together as a group using all the diverse perspectives of your team and uh, leveraging the fact that there's many of you, which gives you exponentially more you know, decision making power. And uh, it's helpful in terms of problem solving. Um, that's much more powerful than doing something on your own, maybe even using the same techniques. So, so that's all. This is so layered and so um, right. Okay, you know, I think I think there's a lot to it. You know, it's, okay. it's a difficult. Everything's inter interconnected here. All right. So the five challenges here they are, and we want to spend a few minutes going through each of them. So no, no need to write them down, dear uh, participants. Here, uh, let's start with the first one: collaborating with teams and organizational leaders. Uh, like I said, to me, you know, this is the, the new normal or the, the old normal here in, in terms of uh, working like that. Collaborating with teams virtually in a hybrid mode has always been our modus operandi. How is it a challenge for most people out there who get thrown into this, this Zoom world of running projects? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, we all talk about wanting to be in the same physical space, you know, I go, running, going back to agility and uh, that was a central tenet of agility, you know, co-location. Um, and now that we've we've spent a lot of time, we've spent a couple of years not being in that physical space. I think we've learned a lot. Um, how, you know, how do we uh, effectively collaborate without that uh, physical space and how do we effectively collaborate without uh, Zoom fatigue? Um, there's a lot that's been done with uh, Miro boards, Miro boards, shared spaces like that, where um, you could have uh, design thinking style collaboration um, 
you know, virtually, where, whereas before, you know, two years ago, we would have said a lot of that has to, is most effectively done uh, in person. Now we've gotten used to those environments and we've been, uh, um, we've been using them very effectively for some time now. Um, I talked a little bit about, you know, in, in the context of collaborating with teams and organizational leaders, um, I talked a little bit about visibility and connectedness, and I'll just say a few words on, on that topic relative to this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, everyone, in terms of visibility, you know, I mentioned the Kanban board bit, but understanding what the backlog of work is, understanding a unified view of progress, you know, whether you're on the team, whether you're leading a team, whether you're an outsider um, looking into a team, or whether you're on a different team entirely that interacts with this team, having that sort of unified view of progress is really, really important. Being able to um, talk to someone across on another team and understand this is where they are and uh, having that visual is, is critically important, not just as a communication tool because you're talking to you know Jerry on the other side of the house and you know he or she understands what a Trello board is and, and you know what, what that backlog actually indicates. Um, but it gives you a mental um, picture, uh, you know, so doing something pictorially like that merely makes it stick in your head. You know, this is what's going on. I, I, re- I can recall that a lot better because I've seen it visually. Um, I can, um, you know, sort of link that up to what's what's been said at the time, you know, during during the time, the actual time of the meeting. Um, and that's really, really important when I go back to that um, Kanban board or whatever the, the backlog looks like. Um, and I, I use that as a reference point. I'm thinking back on on the uh, the voiceover that I've gotten from that person when I met with them, and the fact that this is a familiar sort of reference point, and it's the same reference point for everybody. It's not reframed for executives. It's not you know it's not that everybody has a different view because they built a different reporting you know set of reports because they feel like everyone needs to see things differently. It's the same view for everyone, and that's really really important in terms of you know making the work visible and reporting progress. Um, and then in the discussion, you know, about connection, you know, we talk about uh, making people lives, people's lives easier. Um, I think, you know, one, one topic that's come up with some frequency, especially with our global executive council is um, understanding how to manage the work, you know, being, being a little bit empathetic in terms of, uh, uh, you know, not overloading people. The, the easiest thing in the world to do is to cram things down on them. Um, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is, you know, managing that workflow, making it sustainable, uh, making it so people can do their best work. If you've, if you've got a sense of what that optimal flow is, if you take the time to, to learn that, to understand that, and to interact with the teams enough to, to sort of get where they are on that topic, it's, it's really, really helpful because then they're actually doing their best work. They're not just multitasking, um, in a way that detracts from their their productivity as a whole, they're they're able to do uh, their best at the things that matter most. So, um, of course, prioritization plays into that, um, and just setting a sustainable pace. And I think that's really a big part of the role of organizational leaders in in this context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I I have an example for you in in regards to. The, the first challenge here, collaborating with teams and organizational leaders. And I'm going to bring, you know, connectedness and visibility into this as well. Um, one of our projects, we decided we want to enter the Spanish speaking market. So we translated it or had it translated rather. Um, I speak kind of a little bit of Spanish. Uh, our salespeople don't. And we recently got a request from a big company in Mexico. Um, our project managers, she is a contract project manager for to us, and you know I've I've known her a little bit, and and, and I, I, I didn't really know her that well because you know there is a, a, a as a CEO in the company you always have you know other people working with her. I was on that call, and suddenly there she was full command of the room, able to guide this conversation with this external client. And suddenly I was like, she's great. I had no idea she was this good. So if we had been all together in the same office building where you meet every single day, that connectedness, the visibility, 
between each other, even if you're in different levels of the organization, is much greater because you see each other in the coffee room and you talk and you get to know a person much better. But if you are at a distance, I think this is a challenge, this, this collaborating with teams and organizational leaders. And I think this example also takes us into effective communication because this is a we're in a global world like right? uh, you think everybody speaks english but no in this particular case we had to do this conversation this zoom meeting in spanish so what is the challenge when it comes to effective communication our second of the five challenges here from from your perspective yeah i think you know people talk a lot about um body language, you know, in this context, mm -hmm. you, you, you miss some of the, the cues in the room that you might not, uh, that, that you might have better access to if you're, if you're in person. Um, and I think people have mixed reactions to Canada cameras, but cameras help us connect a bit. You know, you can see me right now, you can see my, my hands moving around and gesturing and uh, get a little bit of a sense of that body language. And um, there's a lot of talk about um, using first names. You know, if, if every every time I address you, I say Cornelius and then say what I mean. Uh, it's it's a way of connecting. So there are little tips like that that you can use. Um, making time for personal topics. You know, um, I might say, you know, ask you about the weather in Arizona. You know, that sort of thing um, to connect with you a little bit at the front end of a conversation. But um, humanizing people is, is is very, very important, you know. So you may not be able to pick up on some of the body language clues that they have to offer. But if, you, um, if you're able to deal with them in a very sort of human to human level, um, I think you're able to connect a little bit more. You're able to um, have them let their guard down a little bit in a productive way, um, connect, you know, on that sort of human to human level. In in that regard, we just got a question here coming up from Murtaza. Any tips for networking? So since we're talking about effective communication, you said, you know, use the person's first name, address them directly. Um, any other ideas and suggestions how we could use the collaboration, the effective communication, how we could overcome that in terms of networking? You know, Murtaza, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, what what I've done a lot more of recently is uh, participated more in social media, not just LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but uh, on Facebook as well. I've connected with a lot of people, uh, blended a lot more of my work life with my personal life, which is happening anyway globally, um, and uh, um, connected with people in that way. That way, I have more fodder for conversation when I am networking. You know, I could say. You know, Cornelius, I saw that your family member did this, you know, particular thing at the front end of a conversation because, because you know, it, it takes all but five seconds to know that, you know, because you see it sort of scroll past. Right. Um, but, it, but it says, I care enough about you to, you know, look at, you know, what's going on in your life and want to keep track of it. Um, I think that's important. Um, mm -hmm. It's becoming yeah, and, uh, I have an example here as well for uh, Murtaza in terms of networking, uh, especially Murtaza, if you're looking for networking within your organization. We have uh, three times a week, we have team meetings uh, because we're all across the globe. And on Fridays, no business talk, period. Right, so we just meet socially. We meet socially. Uh, we call it our water cooler Fridays, and we just talk. So, what was your week like? Uh, how did your dental appointment go? What are you doing tomorrow? So, it's literally getting to know people on a social level. So, using the fact that we are collaborating virtually, uh, using the good communication skills in in this sense, those challenges, and overcoming them by just saying, okay. We're just meeting as people right now. Yeah, I think you know it's it's uh, that, that's a really good example, Cornelius. And on a related note, a lot of our teams, and we've heard of a lot of other teams doing this, hold office hours. You know, like there are people, a team leader might hold office hours, just just sort of get into a Teams room or a Zoom room that they offer the link to. You know, they offer the link to everybody on the team, maybe it's people outside of the team, just to drop by. And sometimes people will hang out in those Teams rooms and just do their everyday work. But the, the, they're just sort of since they're in the team's room while they're doing their there's their uh, the work that they do alone, they could just yeah. sort of speak up and say, hey, how's this going with you and have that water cooler talk. Um, it's just like they're they're uh, 
in a shared space online. It's not like being exactly like being together, um, but it is sort of like walking by someone's desk and, you know, saying hello, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we are in the middle of talking about these five challenges here. Uh, we've looked at collaboration with teams, uh, effective communication. Any closing words from you, Dave, regarding the effective communication before we move on to building relationships across teams? You know, since we were talking about meetings, I will mention one thing. Um, you know, and I talked at the front end of the conversation about managing people the way they need to be managed. I think that's true for establishing a cadence of regular meetings for people. Um, mm -hmm. I think people have different work styles and respecting that is, is extremely important. It's not, uh, you know, it, it's uh, you used to have see uh, most managers have sort of one on ones and a regular cadence with all their direct reports. They do um, this sort of reporting meetings exactly the same way with everyone. Um, that kind of thing we're seeing less of now um, in favor of doing what's right for the particular relationship with the individual you know, depending on how their work uh, is structured, depending on how they like to be managed. Um, a lot of that has to play into that regular meeting cadence. So I think uh, doing things in a more bespoke way is is uh, very, very helpful to communications and helps you avoid a lot of unnecessary meetings that, uh, that really, uh, you know, amp up that Zoom fatigue that we're all afraid of. All right, thank you. So challenge number three, building relationships across teams. I can easily see how that's a problem because you meet with your team probably every day somehow virtually, but the other teams you're not exposed to. So is that the challenge? Did I just hit it on the head? I, uh, I, yeah. I don't know. Yes, you, did. you did, as always you did, ah. <laughs> uh, Cornelius. That's, that is the challenge. And I think uh, um, being... Uh, really proactive and connecting, you know, with, with, with external teams is ex exceedingly important these days. Um, you know, and, and, uh, we always called, uh, we always talked about stakeholder management and, uh, um, uh, in project management, we always, we always discuss that as a, a key topic, you know, how is your work uh, affecting people upstream and downstream from you? Um, how is it affecting work processes? How, you know, stakeholders, uh, of various stripes, who are they and, and how are they being impacted and how they how do they need to be uh, communicated with this is very, very important. And I think uh, what we're seeing here is a lot of sort of walk and talks, um, you know, scheduling like 15 minute chats with these stakeholders, just to check in uh, is a very effective way of, of, of dealing with a lot of those stakeholder relationships. Really, what you're trying to do is bring out key concerns um, and, uh, and, and help people understand what's going on related to those concerns. And I think those 15 minutes sort of walk and talks can be very helpful in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me bring in another question that we have here from, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it uh, from this, but how do you provide work visibility to senior management or external clients who do not want to go into multiple tools to view progress? So this kind of combines, I think the first three that we've had collaboration with teams and organizational leaders, effective communication between everybody and building relationships across teams, I think. Is this a software issue here that we're talking about or is this more on a, on a personal level? I'm, I'm not sure where we want to go with answering this particular question. You know, um, sometimes it's an organizational culture or structure issue. Oh, so, of course, you know. yeah. Uh, and of course, there are um, tools that, that that help with these types of things. I think, you know, when, when I went back to uh, the unified view of the work uh, bit I was, we were talking about earlier in the, in the conversation, um, a Kanban board really, you know, at its best is is meant to be kind of like a one pager. You know, this is what's going on. This is, you know, uh, how we're driving towards uh, the work. This is the backlog of work that, you know, that we're attacking. And a lot of the the who's and why's can be embedded in in a lot of that as well, um, as can some of the goals and, and that sort of thing, depending on how you structure the board. So I think I would structure the board in a way that that includes the hows and the whys, and really the whys, you know, for each one and the, the order of priority for things, um, in a way that executives can understand it and in a way that aligns your team. So if you're structuring the work in a way that where everybody can see this is the outcome that we're all driving mm -hmm. towards. And the the executive management can see this is the outcome that we're all driving towards. This is how we're getting there. Um, everyone should have that same view, 
And that helps not just with uh, communicating to senior management, but it helps with alignment as well. It helps you, you know, your, your team have a greater sense of purpose, motivates them, uh, gets you some of that discretionary effort that you're really looking for from your team. You know, not, not, not that you're stealing it from them, that they're offering it freely because they have more of a, a greater sense of purpose. And uh, usually, you know, those, uh, the executive level folks want to hear, you know, uh, the things that align well with, you know, what is the outcome going to be? What's the, that, that purpose that we're driving towards and how are we getting there? Uh, how effective are we been in getting there? All right. So we are still in these five challenges here. We're looking at building relationships across teams. Um, let's move on to striking a balance between work and home. Both you and I are at home right now. And before you get into looking into this challenge, I have another challenge for you. How do you reach the books behind you, the very top of your bookshelf? I just right? go something like, no. I, <laughs> I, have, yeah, I have so, a ladder I can bring over. Yeah. So. <laughs> what I'm getting at here is, you know, it, we're all working from home. Right. Yeah. And we get a little glimpse into everybody else's home. We see how they live and, and how they where they are at. And, you know, to me, that that was immediately striking. It's like a lot of books. You mm -hmm. must read a lot. But how do you get to them? Right. So that was that was an immediate, immediate question that popped up into my head. What is the challenge, however, in regards to managing hybrid and work projects when it comes through? working from home and, and getting this balance, uh, work-life balance here? You know, it's interesting. I think uh, work-life balance increasingly, people talk about it a lot, but it, it feels like a, a, a false binary choice to me. You know, I think we have all uh, dealt with a situation where it's been more work-life blending uh, for quite some time, um, even prior to COVID, um, that, that was starting to be the case. And now it's a question of managing that blending in a way that works for us. Um, I think it's interesting if you're missing the personal context of, of, of the individuals that you work with, if you're not, if you don't have enough social connection, if you don't have enough empathy for the human being that they are, you're really missing half the story. And part of the way you manage that is by understanding what they're going through, understanding what their priorities are and what might be in the way from a scheduling perspective. Um, as you're as you're working with them, you know they, they may have uh, you know a, a certain thing that they have to do with their children on Tuesdays. You know there may be if you're sensitive to what what you can anticipate from their personal lives. If you're if you're embedded enough in their lives as a human being, it's very very helpful in terms of being able to schedule things out and work with uh, that particular individual. So I think it's more of a blending issue. Um, and I think, you know, people need to, we talk about things like blocking your calendar uh, to, uh, to, to, to get work done. Uh, I think blocking your calendar can be um, uh, a really good thing, but understanding, helping others understand why you're doing that, making your work visible to them, because maybe you need to get this sort of individual work done for two hours during this day and five hours during that day, but letting them know what you're doing versus just blocking it off is, is, is very, very helpful. Um, and I think it helps, you can help each other understand the work that you're doing and thereby make it more sustainable. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, when it comes to communication across the levels and getting executives to, to look at, you know, talk to multiple teams, that it's an organizational uh, culture thing. And when it comes to striking the work-life balance, in my own company, we have a, a, a clear statement. You do not work outside of your work hours. You do not check your email. I do not expect you to log into Slack. When you're on vacation, you're on vacation. Do not say, you know, I'll check my email once a day. No, you're on vacation. Go, recharge. Be a human being. Don't be a worker bee, right? And I think this has to come from the top. And in our situation, this also has to come from the project manager because you're, as a project manager, you're in charge of this project. So you have to lead by example. You have to make clear statements saying, how do I expect you, the team, to strike that balance between work and home? 
You know, Cornelius, I think you make an excellent point. You have to uh, set the example from the top. You have to lead people in a way that is in alignment with the way you'd like to operate. And I think the choices, the specific choices that you make can be uh, aligned with uh, the organization that you run and what works best for you. You know, I think there are situations where um, drawing a hard line between these are the work hours and these are the non-work hours can work for many organizations, depending on what it is that you're doing. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. You know, like you work, you talk about PMI. I have to talk to people in China and India and, you know, and either they have to do it in off hours or, or I do, you know, and that's just a fact of, of life. And I also appreciate the flexibility that comes with that perhaps during the day, you know, where, where I may not, you know, I may be able to go see my son's uh, concert or something, you know, at school, that sort of thing. And I think, um, it's a balance of this flexibility. That's why I was saying it's more of a blend, you know, um, but you're right. Whatever, whatever constructs you're putting in place, whatever structure you're putting in place around that, um, setting the example from the top, you can't, you can't say no emails after five and then send emails after five, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as, as a leader, whether you're a project manager or a CEO, uh, you want to be in alignment with what you're, you know, what you're telling people to do. So and exactly. sometimes it comes from even higher than the top. Sometimes it comes from the government. Uh, don't quote me on this. Was it France or Germany or Austria who recently introduced a new law that says you cannot contact your employees outside of working hours? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So there is that to take into consideration as well. That you know, different countries have different understanding of what it means to be separating work and home. And they put legislation into place that clearly tells you as the organization, this is how it is and not any different. So makes it, of course, also challenging for the project manager uh, to manage this and understand who am I allowed to contact when. It does, it does. But, you know, I'll, I'll go back to those two concepts, the visibility and connectivity yeah. sort of thing. Um, and it, you can feel it, you know, if you're connecting with your team, if you're um, um, motivating them through that connectedness, if they feel a sense of purpose, if they feel connected to you and they're giving you that discretionary effort that that uh, that everybody wants, you know, or, or the showing that they're motivated and they're, mm -hmm. they care about their work. Um, you're going to feel that you're going to feel that. And if you use those sort of uh, those two concepts of visibility and connectedness concepts as a way to sort of guide your actions and guide the way you think about them, I think it's helpful. So, you know, all these are very specific instances, cases of, of what you need to think through. And I think they're wonderful ones, but um, having those two uh, concepts mm -hmm. to guide you, I think is helpful. Yeah, like I said very early on, I had not expected you to bring up the, these two topics. And I think that they bring everything incredibly well, incredibly mm -hmm. well together here. Okay, we're, we're at number four, almost at the end uh, of those five, maintaining motivation with distractions. So I've had two distractions during this interview already. Uh, first, my cat came in. Now she's lying over there. <laughs> and second, my wife noticed that the door was open, so she came and closed the door, right? I don't know if you had any distractions, but it's pretty normal for our team meetings that suddenly somebody goes on mute, a family member comes in, kisses them goodbye, goes to school, or somebody suddenly goes up and says, the dog is barking, I have to go check the door. Um, so these are the type of distractions during the meetings, but outside of meetings, there are others as well. Uh, where do you see the challenges for um, managing these distractions? You know, it's interesting. I think there are a certain number of distractions, moment to moment, day to day distractions. I've had things fall over in the other room and just sort of run out the door and, you know, to address whatever's going on. But I think those are just part of being human. Those are a way of, um, of helping you relate to people, you know, I mean, if they're, if they're going through something, if they're holding a crying baby, that kind of thing, um, giving them the space to do that is, is, is very, very important. It can be a huge relationship builder. Um, I think maintaining motivation is, is the other side of that. And I think, I think of it more at a macro level than a, a, a moment to moment sort of thing. Um, and that has to do with alignment. Um, it has to do with, you know, we talked about like visible shared goals in an earlier part of the conversation. Those are very, very important. So that's a visibility element. Um, the connectedness bit, connecting the goals of the project you're working on, the effort, the initiative that you're working on 
with your career goals is something that each individual can do and, and managers can help individuals do that, understanding the alignment between the two. Um, and if I'm, if I'm a team member um, and I'm looking at the work that we're doing, obviously um, what the team can get done and what I can get done as an individual is, is tremendous and it's different, very, very different. It's on a different level. Um, and when I go to write up my resume, when I go to add to my resume, the um, accomplishments that I want to put into that resume are probably things that the team accomplished. You know, you contributed to greatly as a team member, but the team accomplished a specific outcome for the business. And, uh, and that, that's something that's important to document. So alignment, you know, if you think through as a manager, you think through, you know, what does this mean to that team member, you know, accomplishing the goal of the project, accomplishing the outcome, the business outcome that's meaningful. Um, how might that person articulate that on a resume? How might that uh, experience contribute to their career? Understanding that alignment, which again goes back to understanding to them as a human being, an individual that matters, um, is is tremendously important. If you have that alignment, you have motivation through the distractions. Mm. Thank you very much. So. We had those five challenges, collaborating with teams and organizational leaders, effective communication, building relationships across teams, striking a balance between work and home, and maintaining motivation with distraction. So next, we want to take a look at who needs to address those challenges. But uh, we had a follow-up here, and, and I can answer this one. So we had this question earlier on how to provide visibility, and then they came in a clarification to provide more context. What if a CIO of a large company, Morgan Stanley, does not want to go to tools? I have a potential idea for you here. Um, a former boss of mine, he always had a one-page summary uh, available readily. So wherever he went and met with people, he had his project on a one page. Uh, it was an overhead slide that he used back in the days. So do the same thing. If you go to meet the CIO, be prepared to have a one pager with you. Summarize everything onto one page. Could be on your iPad, could be on your phone, right? Nowadays, do it electronically. Be prepared to show an executive dashboard to the executive that does not want to go into the tools. All right, back to our five challenges and moving on to the question, the next question, and that is, who's responsible for this? We've already said in some cases, it's organizational culture. In other cases, it could be a governmental legislation that is put into place. Um, Dave, what, is, what does your research say what is your opinion? Who needs to be addressing these five challenges? You know, it's interesting, Cornelius. I think I've, I've offered examples, I think, throughout the, the five um, that we were talking about around um, the roles of each within uh, each of the five challenges. Um, but I think everyone is responsible. It's not, it's not a question of uh, uh, it's just the role of senior management to uh, sort of uh, set the stage, if you will. Um, it's it's the the role of the project manager to do that. It's um, in, in agile we talk about team level of accountability, um, and I think that's an important concept here. I think the team is is accountable for um, making things happen, making things work. And when you have team accountability, whether you're talking about within your project team or the larger team, um, you have a sense of duty, a sense of uh, responsibility from each team member. That says, you know, um, I'm going to try to get my part done, and whenever somebody falls down, the team either rushes in to help them, or that that person is, um, if they're not doing their job, it's visible. It's very visible. So if they're not helping achieve that outcome collectively, um, you, you know that's happening. So team accountability, I would say, applies here as well. All right. So it's literally everybody who, yeah. who is responsible for addressing these five challenges. Thank you. Um, not surprising, by the way, because we are teams. We're doing things agile. We are a self-organizing team. So, uh, yeah, everybody shares in the responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting close to the end. Uh, takeaways coming up soon. My last question for you before we get to the takeaways. You talked a little bit about power skills uh, already. Um, what are power skills and how do they help us overcome the five challenges that we have looked at today here? 
you know, power skills broadly defined, if you, if you Google, you know, the term power skills, it's, it's soft skills, you know, it's the kind of things that um, we would find on the leadership side of the talent triangle, if you use PMI parlance. Um, it's interesting, you know, there's, there's a broad range of power skills that are important. What we've mostly focused on at PMI are collaborative leadership and empathy. You'll see a lot of writing in the in the PMI blog about those two. You'll see uh, our interim CEO Mike uh, comment on uh, particularly around empathy in in these days that we're going through uh, now when there's so much going on, there's so much change and so much um, stress in people's lives. Um, being empathetic and and uh, uh, humanizing those people is, is tremendously important. And um, I talked a little bit about the power skills being kind of wrappers around uh, the more technical techniques that you might use. You know, we talked about uh, problem solving, for instance, and how that problem solving wrapped in collaborative leadership or really anything that you're doing wrapped in collaborative leadership, a collaborative style um, is tremendously helpful to um, building team cohesion, building motivation, um, alignment, that sort of thing. Uh, it's tremendously important because everyone feels a sense of ownership and accountability to what it is that you're doing. You help define it, therefore you you own it. Um, and the flip of that is empathy, meaning you know understanding what's going on in people's lives, humanizing those people, um, and understanding what you're asking them to do in the context of who they are and what they're trying to accomplish beyond that. So I think uh, power skills are just tremendously important in general. Um, and I, I could uh, I could go on for quite some time. We've done some research with uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers around um, uh, around a lot of these things, like what they look for, what PMO directors look for in in project managers, and they they talk about things like uh, collaborative leadership and um, and empathy, as as well as things like relationship building, um, strategic thinking, uh, creative problem solving, commercial awareness, those types of things. But again, the collaborative leadership and the empathy is sort of a wrapper. It's something that um, uh, you mostly gain through experience, whereas the technical expertise is something that you gain uh, often through training. All right. Thank you very much. And that now takes us to the close of our conversation here, takeaways. Um, Dave, from our conversation today, what would you say are the two, three, your choice, top takeaways that you want our audience to apply on their projects tomorrow, today even? Yeah, you know, it's it all comes down, I think, to uh, visibility and connectedness. Um, visibility of the people, you know, we all need to see and be seen, you know, uh, other people. Um, and the work, you know, easily understanding what's going on without having a bazillion Zoom meetings um, is, is very, very important. So visibility, very, very important. And then connections, connection to the people uh, born out of empathy and collaboration and, uh, and connections to the work, um, common goals that are good for the collective and good for the individual. Um, so as project managers, it would, you know, these two are really good concepts to guide our decision making and really guide the work. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave. This is a great interview. It went into a direction I hadn't expected. Connectedness, visibility, that's a, that's a wonderful take on it. We all appreciate your time today. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Cornelius. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, do please visit pm-podcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and also PDU information. Yes, you can earn PDUs for watching this uh, webinar here today. If you want to get in touch, our email address is info at pm-podcast.com. And finally... Well, finally, I, I usually show a funny meme here about the topic of our discussion, but frankly, there were just too many to choose from. So here are five memes on working remotely from home. And I think they kind of sum up everyone's experience, I guess. And with that, thank you very much again for joining us today. Until next time.